those people, about how we can group everything into column A and column B, and have attitudes about absolutes, and how we need to get away from that. The reason I'm using Paul as an example is because Paul writes this letter talking about the idea of being imprisoned. Because he was one of those who was frequently imprisoned because of his faith. And later on, I'll talk about how Paul definitely re recognizes the hierarchy in that. You know, we'll, we'll get to that later on. But I want to start off with verse 12, chapter 1, verse 12. Now, I want you to know, brothers and sisters, that what has happened to me has actually served to advance the gospel. As a result, it has become clear throughout the whole palace guard and to everyone else that I am in chains for Christ. And because of my chains, most of the brothers and sisters have become more confident in the Lord and dare all the more to proclaim the gospel without fear. Paul, in his own right, in this passage, becomes a symbol. He becomes a symbol for the church. This, this attitude of, in the same way that we read about people, in, in, in the same way that we read about athletes and celebrities and, and people of important notice that attract the attention of the media, it's in the same way that, have you heard about X? Have you heard about Y? Have you heard about this person? I read this really great article over the weekend. You know, that, that's how a lot of conversations start. You know, uh, something in the media has drawn my attention. Like, have you heard about this person who has impacted the world? In the same way, people are talking about Paul. Have you heard about Paul? He's this guy. He's in jail. And, you know, I know jail has come a long way, but, like, I would like to think that it's still kind of a miserable place if you're not allowed to leave. I, 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 would, I would certainly think that jail is just one of those places that you don't want to vacation to or things like that. And so Paul is in jail. He's in jail. He's in jail in a hostile, you know, in, in a hostile nation, like a nation that absolutely loathes the faith, the faith that he exclaims. And so the natural reaction is, okay, I'm going to keep my head down. I'm just going to keep quiet. We're going to play it cool. I'll serve my time. I'll be out here and that. But no, Paul is not that person. Have you heard about Paul? This guy, Paul, who is in jail proclaiming his faith in Jesus. Have you heard about this guy? This is insane. And so, in the way that Paul exclaims his faith, in turn, other people are inspired by that. Paul becomes a symbol for the early church. He is not, he is not the figurehead. He is not the leader of the church. He does not proclaim to be. But he is such a dedicated follower of Jesus that he is able to exclaim it even in the worst of situations. Now, the reason that Paul talks about how this circumstance that he's in helps advance the gospel, the reason that he talks about that is because he understands, because God is so good at using the worst of situations to bring out the best in people. If Paul is a person imprisoned in a hostile nation and he is able to hold on to his faith, why am I so upset when it rains? or when I get into a car accident, or when something bad happens to me that is absolutely positively beyond my control. Why is it so difficult for me to hang on to that faith and have this polarizing attitude? Because like I said, in the same way that people think that the church is corrupt and evil and no good, we in turn say that, oh, well, there's nothing good out in the world. And the example I always use, and I, I wish he was sitting out here right now, uh, is my brother and his son. Because, like, I look at my nephew, my adorable two-year-old, sometimes kind of loud nephew, most of the time kind of loud nephew, and, and, and I, see, I see all the joy and the goodness in the world, and, and I see all these things, and, and, and I see all the hope in the world in a single person. And if a single person can hold on to that much joy and innocence, then there's got to be more out there. And that's the attitude that Paul has. I may be in jail. I may be falsely imprisoned. I do not deserve to be here. And that's the thing, that's the real kicker, is when we are in circumstances that are so bad and so low of us, 
it is so easy to say, I don't deserve this. And so that's the, that's the key to unlocking the door to, I can act however I want because I don't deserve to be here right now. And so we have this attitude where we just kind of go to the opposite end of things and you know, we, we make the situation out to be so much worse than it is. Verse 15. It is true that some preach Christ out of envy and rivalry, but others out of goodwill. The latter do so out of love, knowing that I am put here for the defense of the gospel. The former preach Christ out of selfish ambition, not sincerely, supposing that they can stir up trouble for me while I am in chains. But what does it matter? The important thing is that in every way, whether from false motives or true, Christ is preached. And because of this, I rejoice. Yes, and I will continue to rejoice. For I know that through your prayers and God's provision of the Spirit of Jesus Christ, what has happened to me will turn out for my deliverance. The early church was such a tricky thing. Like, it was so fragile. It was so, it, it was one of those things where you look at all sorts of movements that have happened throughout the world, and you can recognize those points. Like, like it, um, uh, Steve Jobs, who died last year, um, who was one of the co-founders of Apple, you can, go, you can go back and you can track his history, and you can look at certain points where that's where everything almost fell apart. That's where like the stock plummeted and things weren't good and he decided to come back in and turn things around and now everybody and my mother owns an iPhone. Like literally, my mother owns an iPhone. And so it's, it's one of those things where you can go back and you can track history and you know, in, in, the, in the same way but on a much larger scale, you can go back through the history of Christianity and you can say here's where a person tried to burn all the Bibles. Here's where a person tried to kill all the Christians. Here's, and you look at all these points where you know, Paul exists in such a fragile, turbulent time where people are out there falsely proclaiming Christ so that they can damage his reputation. And Paul says, what does it matter? You know, Jesus' name is getting out there. So those people who think they're being destructive and malicious, they're actually getting Jesus' name out there. And the person who wasn't thinking about it is now thinking about it. And in turn, those people can be converted. Those people can see the light and follow Jesus. And so during this turbulent time, Paul maintains this attitude of, it's all good. You know, like things are happening. Things are in motion. So strong is my personal faith that I know that we will persevere, even though I am in chains, even though I am in jail, even though I may die tomorrow. And that's the thing. We track this back, we look at Paul, and we say, oh, of, of course he maintained his faith. He knew he'd get out of jail. No, that's not true. That's absolutely not true. Paul was in a circumstance where he was falsely imprisoned, and any day they could flip bad evidence on him, they, they, could, you know, they, they could plant false testimony, and they could have him executed. And Paul is such a person that he recognizes this fact and decides to maintain this attitude. He is not a man with a plan. He is not a man who sits there day after day going, any day now I'm going to get out. I'm just going to hang on for two. Because it's so easy to hang on to our faith when there's a timetable. When we're worried about deadlines at work, we say, okay, only a couple more days and I'm in the clear. You know, it was like that in school, it's like that in work. Just a couple more days and I'm in the clear. You know, a couple more days to have vacation. And it's so easy to maintain a positive attitude. But when that timetable goes away and you're staring down that long mile of indefinite time, it becomes so much more difficult to hang on to our faith. Yet, Paul hangs on to it. And he says, what does it matter if people are out there falsely testifying? Like, Jesus' work is still getting done. What drives Paul to this point? And like I said in the beginning, I was going to talk about how the sense of irony is not lost on Paul. Paul, a former officer of the law charged with arresting and ultimately executing and persecuting Christians, was converted when he was struck blind. 
and Jesus appeared to him, and he was able to go and get his sight back and become converted, and then write most of the New Testament. And so, it's one of those things where the sense of irony has got to not be lost on Paul. Because he is in a situation that he has put people in. He is literally in a jail cell intended for a follower of Christ. And at some point or another, there was a point where he was dragging a Christian in there and accusing them of treason against the nation and following the religious zealot. And that sense of irony has got to not be lost on Paul. He's got to recognize the fact that, like, wow, this was, this was me some time ago. This is who I was. And now I'm sitting here proclaiming my faith for Christ in what is probably the most ironic situation of my life. And so he holds on to that. He recognizes that. He understands that. Paul entering into the Christian faith was never an easy process for him. There were some who questioned his motives. There were some who really wondered. And then finally, 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 he gets up to this point where he's able to write to this church. This church who has absolute faith in Paul. And he says, though I am imprisoned, I am imprisoned for Christ. Now this next section is where it really hits the hardest. The idea of hanging on to faith in a faithless world. Verse 20. I eagerly expect and hope that I will in no way be ashamed, but will have sufficient courage so that now as always Christ will be exalted in my body, whether by life or by death. For to me, to live in Christ and to die is gain. If I am to go on living in this body, this will mean fruitful labor for me. Yet what shall I choose, I do not know. I am torn between the two. I desire to depart and be with Christ, which is better by far. But it is more necessary for you that I remain in this body. Convinced by this, I know that I will remain, and I will continue with all of you for your progress and joy in the faith, so that through my being with you again, your boasting in Christ Jesus will abound by account of me. Paul hits on some pretty hard truths here. He says, I will continue to serve Christ. I will continue to follow him, and I will serve him in any way, either in my life or in my death. And he's faced with a difficult situation. Because the, the last time, the last time I, I preached, I preached on Stephen, and I talked about how that ultimatum is always given. Like, hey man, just settle down. Just let it go. Just let Jesus go, and you're out of here. Well, I guess that wasn't the last one. It was probably the time before. That's right. But that ultimatum is always given. The ultimatum of, come on, <coughs> you don't have to follow Jesus. You, you can just drop it, and you're good. You can go. And Paul, and Paul holds on to his faith. And he talks about how he's torn between the two, because ultimately... That's the thing that we're all going to have to face, whether in our youth or our old age or whatever. But the idea of being torn between the life we live and the life we seek with God. To be able to put all of our, you know, to, to figure, figuratively speak, to put our cards on the table. And to say, Lord, this is who I am. This is who I am. This is what I've done. This is the person I've chosen to be. Here are my cards. I'm done. And so Paul talks about how he has this assurance that he will be with God. He knows that he'll be with God. And he wants to be with God. And that's the easier path. You know, he could, he could really mouth off to the guards and, you know, uh, they could end it for him. Or, you know, it's just one of many, like, unfortunate circumstances. But Paul recognizes that influence that he has on this church and other churches. He recognizes the fact that there are people out there who rely on him, who turn to him for strength. <clears throat> Paul's life takes difficult turns because he was a person of importance. He was a person that God recognized was so important that he decided that 
Paul needed to serve God because of his charisma or influence or leadership or whatever it is. But it's one of those things where, you know, Paul was a person who basically had everything. You know, he probably lived in a decent place. He had a great, important job. People respected him. People feared him. You know, before he was Paul, he was Saul. And you talk about Saul around the Christians, and you better keep quiet. You know, because uh, that's somebody that, like, we don't like. And so he was this person who had to give up everything. Because he's converted, and therefore he can no longer persecute Christians. So he loses his job, he loses his status. And he's got to go in with a group of people who don't necessarily think he's the best character. You know, hey, it's that guy who persecuted my brother, and he wants to join the club. You know, like, what do you do with that? And so Paul's life takes all these difficult turns. But he understands his influence at this point is so great among the believers. And we're often torn between the world we live in and the world we see. And even Paul, the mighty Paul, you know, the apostle Paul, and, you know, whatever you want to reference him as, had a conflict of interest. He's a person who sat in a jail cell night after night for this you know, indeterminate amount of time, thinking, like, is it really worth carrying on? Is it really worth being the good guy? Because doing the right thing is definitely not always the easiest thing. Not by a long shot. And there are countless circumstances that we can count throughout our lives. Countless circumstances that we can count. It's a contradicting statement. There are countless circumstances in our life that we can reference. Um, and we can see that you know, there's the right path, and then there's the easy path. Or sometimes the right path is the easy path. Or sometimes it's the hardest path. But Paul goes through the situation, and, he, and he's just got to buck up. But, because ultimately that's what happens. Because he's writing in this letter, and he's like, I'm torn, and I don't know what I want, and I want to be with God, but I recognize I need to be here. And then by the end of this section, he says, you know what? I've got to be here. I've got to tough it out because all these things that I do impact other people. And it is weird to think, you know, the scope of time. Like we're talking <coughs> early first century AD. We're talking early, you know, like, like, like mid first century AD. And like a man <coughs> sits in a jail cell and he writes a letter. And it is 2012 AD. And I'm reading that letter to you right now. So great was Paul's influence that his, that his, his literature, his, the letters that he wrote to these people survive. Just like, like, like generations and millennia. There are so few things that we can say that survived a millennia. Like, like that, that's so crazy to think about that. It's 2012. I, I keep almost saying 2011, but it's definitely in January. But it's 2012. And this letter survives so that we can be inspired. We, in turn, generations later, are called. But we're not called in the same way that Paul is called. But we're called to be support. We're called to be influences to people. We're called to show the grace of God through our actions in good times and in trying times. That is what we are called to do as Christians. And that is why Paul was willing to sit in a jail cell and why he was there and he was ready to die for his faith so that we who are not in as dangerous of a circumstance can still be inspired and realize that the actions that we take and the lives that we lead are for a purpose and that we impact people every single day whether we recognize it or not. The words we say, the lives we lead, the people that we are, are ultimately impactful, positively or negatively, on people. And we strive so hard for that positive action. But the one thing to consider is to not be that person who deals in absolutes. Except when you talk about the absolute love of God. The absolute love of God who looks at these people who suffer through these circumstances and says, I will take care of you. And I ask you today, if you have not joined that, if you have not joined the faith and you want to, 
or if you've stumbled off, off the path and you've become a person who deals in those polarizing details, who say that the world is no good, that there's nothing good left in it, and you want to come back from that, come back from that. Seek encouragement, seek prayer, seek redemption. Seek a God who ultimately loves us so much. Because people say, you know, both believers and non-believers, people say, that there's no good left in the world, that if you look at the conflicts that go on, and if you read the newspaper, there's absolutely no good. But I disagree. Because I see the beauty in the little things, and I recognize that there's a God who wants us to continue, who allows us to continue, who, who looks down at the world and says that there's enough good there to make it worthwhile. To say that, like, continue to raise generations, because for all the bad, there is so much greater good. And to find the good in the little things every day. Because it's not always going to be obvious. It's not. And that's, that's the unfortunate thing. It's not always going to be there. But it's there. It's there every day. It's there, more importantly, it's there every time you need it. Like, just think back to it. Think back to those worst of times and how you came back from that. And be inspired by that as we stand and sing the song of invitation. Mm -hmm.